everyone, Natalie Villalobos here at Google I.O. Extremely proud to introduce Jackie, Jackie O, like the Jackie O, Jackie Almost Holiday. She is an environmental justice tech maven here at I.O. And we get to hear a little bit about her work and the innovations that she's driving in environmental justice. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. So tell me, how did you get involved in the tech industry? Well, I think that's kind of funny because I'm kind of dating myself, but like I got involved in tech when my uncle gave me my first Commodore 64. Okay. So that really does like date me. And I've kind of been in love with computers and technology and all those things ever since. So that's probably like 30 plus years now. What was the first project that really struck your passion, that knew you wanted to get into technology? Um, I think one of like the first projects was um, after I graduated actually college and I was working doing a fellowship um, for Bill Clinton and I was working in Africa awesome. on like improving public health outcomes there mm -hmm. and there were so many opportunities to use technology in a way that was for social good and that would really really have like this substantial impact on how people experience their lives and their outcomes and health and environmental issues and that's kind of when I really really became interested in this cross-section between like health and environmental justice and technology and how all these amazing innovations that people are doing and creating could drive social good. Yeah, so it's not just that one industry is siloed from another industry, you're actually kind of cross-breeding this hybridization, this place where technology meets health and environmental justice. So tell me, how did you land on environmental justice? Why this particular topic? Um, I think because like right now, especially in this time, as we deal with like climate change and global warming, and we see particularly in California with like the drought, like environmental justice is the issue right now. And it affects all of us, no matter where we are. And collectively, we really can tackle and use the, the collective brain power of all of us to address some of these issues. And so you settled on Southeast San Francisco as a place to really dig into your work. Tell me why that particular community and what you found in creating this project. Well, I think it's like so amazing that I'm here in San Francisco, which is the tech capital of the world, hands down. And I work for a fabulous organization called the San Francisco Parks Alliance, which it deals with like parks and open space and access to open space. And you think of San Francisco as being this global mecca of wealth, technology, prosperity, all those things. But yet, the communities in the southeast of San Francisco haven't been able to access or tap into any of those really? benefits for multiple reasons. And if you look at some of the history of San Francisco around some of the environmental degradation that happened there with nuclear sites, with like the whole landfill and how that seismically is very dangerous when you build housing on top of things that isn't land, things that aren't land. Um, so um, I wanted to make sure that communities in the Southeast are connected to the wealth of information and knowledge and prosperity and environmental justice because the sea is rising and lots of those people live on the waterfront. Yeah, so you, in this work, are you making this area more accessible, safer? Tell me specifically how you're addressing this problem with this community. So it's, a, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, I am a director of a project called the Blue Green Way which is an initiative that has been led by the San Francisco Parks Alliance. And what we are doing is there is 13 miles of waterfront shoreline in the southeast part of San Francisco that probably since in the last 60 years has not been accessible to communities in the southeast. So you have people that live a half a mile, a quarter of a mile away from the waterfront and have not been able to access it, touch it for multiple reasons. One, some of it was active, was active nuclear sites. Um, two, it was lots of closed off for industrial reasons and other reasons. So part of the project that I'm leading with the Park Alliance is around making those, those areas open and accessible to communities in the Southeast. So it involves like the cleanup, it involves protecting like the native Bay Area species, it involves conserving and creating new wetlands which help protect us against um, climate change and sea level rising. It involves connecting the community to and using technology to connect the community to what actually is happening on the waterfront. Because lots of people don't know. And I'm only one person and I do do a lot of community engagement, but at the same time, pretty much everyone in this day and time has a cell phone and has a smartphone. And part of what we're doing is creating this platform using mobile technology that people can look on their cell phone and they can go up and down all 13 miles of that waterfront and discover what has happened, what will happen, and what they can do to participate in it. So you're bringing the community into the work. It's not like solving the problem, coming in and fixing it, you're engaging the community to solve 
for themselves in a lot of yes, ways. Yes, exactly. It's all about empowering the community because obviously I can't do this by myself, nor could the Parks and Life do it by herself. And the community has to has to value it and has to see it as a win-win for them. Yep. And the way you do that is you engage the community and you use the fabulous thing called like technology. Who can't sit and like right. twiddle on their phone and like comment on something or drive an initiative or suggest something. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about like technology is that you have like groupthink and you can have millions of people together and like pr trying to solve a certain problem. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm very passionate about having underrepresented groups or, or communities not feel just like they consume technology, but they can create, they can make the technology. And I think a lot of times People just aren't in that mindset, right? They're just kind of feeling like it's something that they receive and not yes. something they actively participate in. And so we have an incredible audience of millions of developers around the world. How can developers or designers, or really anyone, help you? Oh my God, there's so many ways they can help me. <laughs> First of all, they can definitely reach out to me. Um, follow me on Twitter, at Jackie Omeltelliday. And I would say, comment, like give us feedback, like let us know, like suggestions. There's so, even in, in the two days that I've been here or a day and a half, I found out so many wonderful things and apps and applications that are people are, are developing that could be incorporated into this whole environmental justice, social justice movement that we're creating and growing in the Southeast communities of San Francisco. So would love for developers to come and donate their time and energy to like thinking big and every meeting I go to and every time I'm talking to people in the southeast like the actual residents there I say we can think big we can make this as big as we want to make because the power is within us to do that yeah and just for those tuning in when we're saying the southeast we're meaning southeast San Francisco yes. we just want to make sure that the developers all go to the right place yes <laughs> yes so you've had this extreme passion for solving for communities and really social justice issues for a very long time with technology going you know, in the, the way of the Internet of Things or wearables and, and these new ways of technology engaging consumers, what do you want to see solved in your lifetime given the incredible possibilities of technology? I think as much that can be as solved as possible. <laughs> like, I would say I wouldn't even limit it or close the door. Like, whatever we can solve in, like, my lifetime, and who knows what my lifetime will be given what technology is doing right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe my body will be in something else in some other shape or form or time. But I think that um, one of the big things is making sure that underserved communities have access to, to technology, both from a user experience but also a participatory, actually, creation-wise as well. And so... So with your work, are you collaborating with other communities around the world that have, might have incurred similar issues, or do you feel like this particular project is unique in, its, in what it's experienced? No, the funny thing is it's not necessarily very unique. It's unique in yeah. the situation that the, this time right now in San Francisco, when you think about San Francisco, you don't think about nuclear waste sites, or you don't think about hydrocarbon um, damage and pollution done, or you don't think of San Francisco as having some of the highest, the southeast part of San Francisco, as some having some of the highest asthma rates in oh, the really? state of California. But and some of those asthma rates mirror some of the other countries in the developing world. So in some ways, our experiences are very similar. And part of the work I am doing is also reaching out and studying some of the best practices from other countries and kind of what they've done as they tackle environmental justice issues using technology and other resources. So in the lifespan of your project, are you at the beginning, the middle, or the end? And can you share a story of maybe interacting and engaging with the community that shines a light on how your work is truly improving the community in Southeast San Francisco? So we are still very much in like the beginning stages. I mean, a lot of it is still is very much like ideation because um, when you're participatory and when you do true community engagement, it involves speaking out to lots and lots of stakeholders, which I really enjoy doing. I love hearing people's stories. I love like when people tell me like they never thought in their lifetime that they would actually be able to put their toes in the water of San Francisco right wow. near their houses, which is pretty powerful when you think that some of these individuals are third and fourth generations in those neighborhoods and they actually never thought that they could walk out of their house walk across the street and actually touch the water. So those are some of the most powerful messages that I get. And then also like so people thought that because a lot of the things are former like nuclear sites, it was all classified information. And so now the fact that I've been able to open kind of like that door of, okay, this is what is happening there. And this is the timeline for various cleanups, et cetera. And what all these different terminologies mean in environmental cleanup. Like that is just so powerful. I think information is probably the best gift that you 
you can give people information connected to how they can actually act and, and change the world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I personally, I've been a, I'm an, actually an 11th generation Californian. So uh -huh. I, my family's been here for a really long time and, and I live over in the East Bay. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel now privileged and completely unaware that this was a problem in my neighborhood. And so do you have a website so we're all going to follow you on Twitter. Okay, but definitely. is there a central place that we can read about this work online and, and dig into some of this research? I know it's incredibly powerful, like organizations like Code for America, mm -hmm. you know, opening up access to, that's more like city information, but how do we open up more of this this and, and research it and, and assist you. So do you have a, another site? or? So there actually is. So if you go to sfparksalliance.org, um, and you search that site, Blue Greenway, there's all the information. And we're actually in the process of building a brand new website that'll have a reservoir of information and pulling from data from multiple different sources so Very that cool. anyone around the world can find out exactly what's going on and how they can help and participate. And, and hopefully what you set up here is a model for what can be then moved to other places around the world, right, where they're experiencing similar environmental justice issues. So we're at I.O. Mm -hmm. What has been your favorite thing so far? Oh my goodness, I'm like fascinated by like Project Tango. Okay. Like I probably spent, I don't know, maybe like an hour up there like picking their brains of everything like possible with that piece of technology. Because in some ways, like as I said, like particularly with communities in the southeast of San Francisco, some of them have not been able to experience like past state, as in before all the environmental degradation, because it also has happened within their lifetime, but also future states. A lot of people can't even envision what is possible. And that technology actually makes it happen where they can actually see what a cleanup site would look like, see what it's like to like experience their waterfront in a different way, but also go through history and see all the horrible things that happen because there's, there's lessons to be learned from history so that we don't repeat itself. So I think that is just, and visually see, and I think visuals actually speak to people in ways that telling like the ways that reading about it just don't do. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, prior to uh, doing, so I work on women in technology at Google, mm -hmm. and prior to this work, I was also working with Native Americans to help them map their lands. Mm -hmm. A common issue with uh, another underserved community with them is that sometimes they, they can't find or, or really map correctly the boundaries of their land. Mm -hmm. And so when people are encroaching on their land, it's like, they need some GPS markers. Yes. They need these yes. tools to be able to really be in an empowered place to defend themselves, mm -hmm. right? So after your project is completed, what do you, what, are you going to continue working on environmental justice or do you think you'd want to move over back into healthcare or maybe take this to another country? Um, I don't know, but I definitely see like environmental justice connected to health because environmental issues affect health outcomes. Like, yep. So I see like that intersection and I also see that given the, the history, particularly with the communities in the southeast, I'm going to be working that project for a really long time, like, and unfortunately. Is this like a 10-year problem? Um, this is probably more like a 40-year problem. Okay, so we still okay. got a lot of, okay. like, we still definitely have, like, a lot of work to do. There's still, like, a lot of cleanup happening. But the, the, rea the truth is that, at least within the next, like, three years, people will actually be able to see changes that are happening along, like, their waterfront, and they'll also be able to, like, access both from a technology perspective, but also from a physical perspective, um, their waterfront and be updated about what is going on, but also participate in the decisions that are being made and kind of drive their own future of, of the, the space they inhabit. Well, I've been sitting here with Jackie Omas Holiday. She is the Jackie O here at, at Google I.O. She's also an environmental justice tech maven. Thank you so much for committing your life and being an advocate for the people of Southeast San Francisco and for improving all of our lives with technology. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.